and then we'll get started on our new material. So this week is when we move from the descriptive statistics describing data into actually trying to make conclusions about a population. And so we've described our samples, we found mean, median, mode, all of that. Well, now we want to estimate a population parameter. And the ones we're gonna be looking at is means and proportions. Um, we can estimate standard deviations and variances, but those get to be more complex um, problems. And that'd be for a much longer, more in-depth course than this one. Strategies, um, one of the ways that we do this is something called a point estimate. And a point estimate is just to randomly select a sample from the population, calculate the sample statistic, whether that is a mean or a proportion, and then claim that the population parameter is approximately equal to that sample statistic. So we're, we're, we take the sample, we get that one sample statistic, that one point, that one number, and we use that as our estimate of the population parameter. That's why it's called a point estimate. We're estimating it with a single point. But we've learned over the last couple of weeks about something called a sampling distribution. And then sampling distributions are for the population mean or the population proportion. And what they are is, um, let's use means here, is if we take all samples of a certain size, We'll call that size n and find the mean of those samples of each sample I should say those means are the sampling distribution and while those means are closer to the population mean they still follow a normal curve so they'll be distributed around the population mean. The mean of the sample means will be the center of that curve and it will be equal to the population mean, but it is still possible to have samples that have means that are way smaller or means that are way larger than the population mean. Of course, the bigger the sample size is, the, the narrower that curve gets. So the closer those sample means will be to the population mean, but they're not required to be equal to it. Well, how far away are they? Well, that's where the normal probabilities in that sampling distribution come in, come, come into play. Um, let's say we decide we want to know the range in which the middle 90% of the sample means will fall. Also, that means we're going to literally take 90% out of the middle of our curve. The other 10% is split evenly with 5% on each tail of the curve. Um, and we can find those cutoff values from our, our sampling distribution. The most more important part though, is this distance from the mean out to that cutoff. In either direction, it'll be the same distance in either direction. That distance, depending on what textbook you use, um, this textbook calls it a margin of error. Some textbooks call it the bound on the error. And basically it's just a distance and it's based on whether we want 90% out of the middle or 80% or 95%. Distance from the mean out to the edge of that interval that'll contain that desired percentage, that 90% in this case of all the sample means. Why is that distance so important? Well, because if we turn around now and we say, okay, I'm gonna take a sample of that size and I'm gonna find its mean. Well, let's say the sample mean is here. It's a little bit small, but if I 
go that distance on either end of that sample mean, notice it includes the population mean. Or if I take another sample and it gives a mean over here, but if I go that distance on either side of that sample mean, again, I get an interval that contains the population mean. This is what we refer to as interval estimates. We use the sample statistic as the center of the interval. Then the uh, margin of error from the sampling distribution to get lower limits and upper limits. Well, let's look at how this works. Let's look at an interval for a population proportion first. So recall in the sampling distribution for a population proportion, the uh, mean of the sample proportions is equal to the population proportion. And the standard deviation of the sample proportions is equal to the square root of the population proportion times one minus the population proportion over n. <clears throat> when we're looking, however, at finding our margin of error, We also need the critical value of Z from the normal distribution. All confidence intervals for a population proportion will be Z intervals. How do we find that critical value of Z? Actually, there's going to be two critical values, but they'll be the same, one positive and one negative. Well, it comes from the level of confidence. And this is something that has to be given in the problem. We have to be told what level of confidence we're going to be working with. And um, let's say we're dealing with the most common level of confidence is 95%. So what that means in our bell curve, we want 95% out of the middle of the data to be inside our interval. We're leaving 5% outside and that 5% is split evenly to 2.5% on either tail, the lower tail and the upper tail. So then we've created two cutoffs here. This cutoff has a left tail area of 2.5% or 0 0.025. This cutoff has a left tail area, if we add that up, of 97.5% or 0.975 probability. So we're gonna do an inverse normal on each of those to get the Z score or the critical value um, for each of those boundaries. So um, we're going to do second distribution, inverse normal, 0 0.025 is our probability. Oops, 0 0.025. And we're doing z score, so it's a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, so it's a standard normal distribution. And we get a negative 1.96 if we round that to three decimal places, um, negative 1.60. We do the other side, the other end, inverse normal, 0.975, mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and we get a positive 1.960. For the confidence intervals, those values should both always be the same value, just one positive, one negative. We will call the positive, when we do our critical value, they're actually both critical values, but we tend to just list the positive one when we list our critical values. So our Z critical for 95% would be a 1.96. So let's take a peek here at our creating a, a confidence interval. 
First of all, for proportions, there are some requirements. We must have n times p must be at least 10. n times 1 minus p must also be at least 10. What does this mean? Well, this means we have to have a sufficient sample size. Um, we have to have a big enough sample so that we can reasonably expect at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Um, if we're flipping a coin, you got half and half. Or if you have coins sitting on the table, you know, like how many are heads, how many are tails? Well, if there's just two coins and there's one heads and one tail, that, that's not enough. That you got to have at least, you know, two coins would just be a, a sample size of n equals two. You've got to have a large enough sample to have at least reasonably expect 10 failures and, and 10 successes. And of course, the sample is selected randomly from the population of interest. I won't state that third requirement anymore, but um, that is a requirement of all of these confidence intervals is that the sample is selected, randomly selected from the population of interest. So let's look at our example here now. Um, create a 90% confidence interval for a random sample of 240 students whose 187 passed their first college math class on the first try. So 90%, 240, uh, 187 out of 240 is our sample result. We need our Z critical. Well, 90% would be 90% out of the middle. That 10% is split to each side, so it'd be 5% and 5%. So we can do an inverse normal on the 5%. We're gonna get a negative value, but remember we'll use it as positive. Inverse, second distribution, inverse normal, 0.05. It'll give us a negative 1.645. So our Z equal is 1.645. Our margin of error bound on the error, I'm gonna label ME for margin of error, is the Z critical times the standard error. Now remember for um, distribution of proportions, that standard error is the square root of P times one minus P divided by N. So here, that margin of error for be Z critical 1.645 times the square root of now we have a sample proportion here. We can use that. So 187 divided by 240. Of 0.7792, we're gonna just keep it to four decimal places here. And then times one minus 0 0.7792. And then divided by the sample size, 240. So let's calculate that margin of error. So 1.645 times the square root of. 0.7792 times parentheses 1 minus 0.7792, close parentheses, divided by 240 equals 0 0.0440. So that's our margin of error, 0 0.0440. So now our interval, now remember what we calculated up here was the point estimate. Oh, I'll type it. The 187 divided by 240, gives the point uh, 7792 was the point estimate. Our interval then will be that point estimate minus the margin of error, 
to that point estimate plus the margin of error. And so to finish that off, it's point seven three five two to point eight uh, two three two, I believe is what that adds up. Not bad really to calculate that margin of error in that interval, but the calculator will do this for us. So let's go to the calculator. And to do this with the built-in function of the calculator, we go to stat and we arrow over to the test menu. And notice these are tests. We're gonna do com uh, um, hypothesis testing next week. Those first several that say tests, use that. We wanna get down into the intervals. Now there is a Z interval here, option seven, but that Z, inter the regular Z interval is for me. So we've gotta get all the way down to option A here, one proportion, one prop Z interval stands for one proportion Z interval. So we select that. X is our number of successes. That was the 187. And was our sample size, that was the 240. Our confidence level here was 90%, so 0.9. Calculate. And there we go, 0 0.73512 to 0.82. 321, and that is basically what we had before. Um, so you can see a little bit of round off error was about it. Otherwise, it is the same interval, or the same result. The calculator is more precise than doing it by hand because when we do this by hand, those we rounded off several times. First of all, our point estimate here is rounded because this wasn't really 0 0.779, 779166666. We had to round that. Our margin of error was rounded. That was really 0 0.04403 something. And so we rounded in several places as when we did this calculation by hand, or the calculator just did it all at once. So it does get a more precise answer, a much easier. So if we did the calculator and we got this interval, what if it asked us to find the margin of error? Well, we can find the margin of error from that calculator value by simply taking the upper limit, the 0.82321, minus the lower limit, 0.73512, and dividing by two. The margin of error is just half of the interval. And if I do that division, I might need the point eight two three two one minus point eight seven three five one two divided by two. We get point zero four four zero four five. So you can see. Um, it's really close, basically the same as our margin of error, just a little more precise. Um, again, because they didn't have all the round offs of different steps through that calculation. When we're working through, um, as we said, the, there, there are tables and there are stuff, but it generally is more precise to use the calculator and use the built-in function than it is to try to do these by hand. Well, let's look at intervals for population means. So if I'm trying to estimate a population mean, I will have one of two things. If I know the population standard deviation. Because I need to know the population, the, the uh, standard error of those sample means. So I know the distribution. If I know that, then it's just going to be a Z interval. If we do not know the population standard deviation, 
Well then, in order we will use the sample standard deviation to estimate the uh, standard error. And we'll use a T distribution. It's sometimes referred to as the student T distribution. It's a different probability distribution. Um, it's still a bell curve and it's still symmetrical, just like the normal curve. But the curve, the, the size of the curve depends on the size of the sample, something called degrees of freedom. Abbreviated to EF. And degrees of freedom is just equal to the sample size minus one. And these degrees of freedom, the, the smaller degrees of freedom are, the, the wider the curve is, and the larger the degrees of freedom, the narrower it is. It adjusts the curve based on the sample size because we're using a sample standard deviation and we would expect the sample standard deviation to be smaller than the population standard deviation. Less items in the group, less variation. So the, the T distribution uses the sample size and those degrees of freedoms to adjust the probabilities, adjust our T critical values um, to account for the fact that we're using the sample standard deviation rather than the population standard deviation. Let's look at an example. So let's say we have asked to construct the 98% confidence interval for the population mean a random sample of 53 items gives a mean of 28 and the population mean, population, population standard deviation is known to be seven. So the key phrase here is population standard deviation is known to be seven. That means we know the population standard deviation, which tells us this is a Z interval. The wording can be a little subtle here. I mean, I came out and said it. it's known that the population standard deviation is this. Um, but if we don't have the population standard deviation, a lot of times it just says, hey, a sample gives this mean and this standard deviation. Well, you got to read into that. The sample is giving the standard deviation. Therefore, we don't know the population standard deviation. So you have to be very careful how you read these to know whether that standard deviation given is for the sample or the, the population. And here's the population. So 98% would mean 98% on the inside, which the other 2% is split 1% to each wing. So we could find the critical value of Z by doing second distribution inverse Z 0.01 and get that inverse normal of negative 2.326 or just 2.326. So our Z critical is 2.326. So our margin of error is 2.326 times the standard error, which is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So that will give, if we calculate that out, 2.326 times seven divided by the square root of 53 of 2.237. So seven divided by the square root of 53 is almost one. So it's a little bit, it's not always going to be that our margin of error is that close to the Z critical. Um, it's just a coincidence because our standard deviation and our square root of our sample size are close to the same. So 2.237 is our margin of error. And of course, our point estimate 
from the problem is 28. So the interval would be from 28 minus 2.237 to 28 plus 2.237, which is an interval of 25.763 to 30.237. There's our, our interval. Again, the calculator does this wonderfully. Let's see what the calculator would do with this. So again, we're going to go to stat and we're going to go over to the test menu. And this is just a Z interval, option number seven. So I'm just going to hit seven so I don't have to arrow down to it. Now we are not using data. If I actually had the whole, the list of all of the results in our sample, all of the data values in the sample, I'd use data. We don't have that, so we're going to use stats. All we have are the summary statistics from our sample. The mean of our sample was, uh, where is that? It was 28. I'm sorry, the standard deviation, that's not the mean, that's the standard deviation of our population was seven, that's sigma. X bar is the mean of our sample, that was 28. Our sample size was 53. And our confidence level was 98%, so 0.98. And we hit calculate. And there we get the exact interval that we had calculating it by hand. Um, because you know the, the means are generally working with larger numbers than proportions, um, the round off errors are not quite as significant. So that is when we do know the population standard deviation. What about if you do not know the population standard deviation? So our example here. Oops. Find the 92%. Normally 90 and 95% are the most common. 99% is sometimes used. I'm using some odd ones here just so we don't fall into the complacency of having common um, critical values that we just have memorized. It forces us to look them up. Find the 92% confidence interval for the population mean if a sample of 42 items gives a mean of 83 and standard deviation of 12. So here it is saying that the sample gives a mean of 42 and a standard deviation of 12. Or sorry, a mean of 83 and a standard deviation of 12. So it's the sample standard deviation, which means that this is a T interval. Find the critical value of T. We need degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are the sample size, 42 minus one. In the left tail area, this is a 92% interval, it means 92% is in the middle. There's 8% outside, that would be 4% to each tail. So let's find the T critical. So second distribution. Inverse T is what we would use, so 0 0.04. And our degrees of freedom, 42 is our sample size, so minus one is 41 degrees of freedom. Giving us a negative 1.795. So 1.795 is our critical value of T. So our margin of error would then be found using 1.795 times that standard deviation of 12 divided by the square root of the sample size of 42. Rather than finding that margin and doing the interval, let's just now go to the calculator and get the interval. So we're going to go to stat, arrow over to test. We've got to arrow down. We've got to find t interval. And it should be option eight. There it is, T interval. Again, we're using the summary statistics from our sample. 
X bar was a sample mean of 83. SX was a sample standard deviation of 12. Sample size was 42. And our confidence level was 92%, so 0.92. We hit calculate. And there's a 967, the, or sorry, 79.676 to 86.324. Now, if we wanted our margin of error, we would again, we could find that by simply finding the range and dividing by two. 86.324 minus 79.676 divided by 2, which gives us 3.32 is our margin of error. So finding these intervals using our functions on the calculator is pretty simple. It's not terrible to do it by hand. Really, the toughest part of doing it by hand is the critical value of z or the critical value of t. Now, each of these then leads us into required sample size calculation. So in other words, what if we want to limit the size of our margin of error? So we want to get our, we want a certain level of confidence. We want to narrow our interval, make it a smaller interval. Well, there are two ways to change the size of an interval. To make the interval smaller, confidence, or Choose a larger sample size. Now there's a third factor, deviation, but we can't control the standard deviation. So we don't worry about how that affects. The standard deviation gets bigger, the margin of error gets bigger. Standard deviation gets smaller, the margin of error gets smaller. But we can't change that. We can change the confidence level we use and we can change the size of our sample. Well, if we want, if there's a certain level of confidence that we want, like in medical studies, Studies or in some cases, the, the level of confidence required is given to us by either industrial standards or requested by an outside party. Um, so the only thing then that we can change is the sample size. Sample size required to limit the margin of error. If it is a population proportion. Remember, the margin of error here was equal to z critical times the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n. Well, if we solve this for n, we get that n equals z critical divided by the margin of error, that p squared, times p times 1 minus p. So let's uh, take a gander at what that would require. Find the minimum sample size required to limit the margin of error. or a population proportion of a 95% confidence interval to be within margin of error to be no more than 3% or 0 0.03. Well, looking at this, you might realize, well, there's, we need the value of P. Well, no, we don't have an estimate of p, then we use p equals 0.5. p equals 0.5 is what we call worst case scenario. That'll give us the largest 
sample size. So our sample size equals um, Z critical for 95% is 1.960. So 1.96 divided by 0 0.03, and then that'll be squared, times 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5. Now let's go to the calculator and see what that gives us. So parentheses, 1.96 divided by 0 0.03, close parentheses, squared, times 0.5 times minus 0.5. Gives us 1,067.1. One, 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 one. On these, now that is the minimum sample size. So I can't round it to 1,067 because that would be too small. So we always round up. So here our required sample size would be N equals 1,068. However, we can make that if we have an estimate of the proportion. So let's say we have an estimate of P uh, equals 0.35. Now that changes things now. Now it'd be N equals 1.96 divided by 0 0.03 squared times 0.35 times 1 minus 0.35. And let's go to that one in and see how that works out differently. So parentheses, 1.96 divided by 0 0.03, close parentheses, squared, times 0.35 times 1 minus 0.35. Now, realistically, if I'm doing this, I can subtract a proportion from one in my head. I would just put in 0.35 times 0.65. Saved a few keystrokes, but we can put it in with the parentheses here. So we get 971.07. So since it's 0.07, it is really tempting to just round it to 971, but remember we can't. That would be too small. 971.07 minimum sample size. So we'd have to round up to 972. So you can see that by having that estimate of P, we were able to take a little bit smaller sample. But if we don't have the estimate of P, using P equals 0.5 is going to, like I said, going to give us that worst case scenario so we can get a sample that is definitely large enough. For our population mean, we have to have some sort of an estimate of the, the population standard deviation in order to make this work. If we don't have a population standard deviation there, um, there's no way to do this or some sort of standard deviation estimate. So let's find the minimum sample size required to produce a sample within our margin of error of no more than four if the population standard deviation is known to be nine and we are using, actually, let's use 90% interval. So remember, our margin of error for a Z interval for the means was Z critical times the, the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. If I'm solving that for N, I get n equals 0.5 
Z critical times the standard deviation divided by the margin of error, and that's all squared. So in this problem, that would be um, Z critical for 90% is 1.645 times our standard deviation of nine divided by our desired margin, and that's all be squared. Let's see what we get there. So parentheses, 1.45 times the standard deviation of nine divided by our desired margin of error of four, close parentheses, and squared. We get 13.699, 13.7 we'll go with. And of course, we round up to 14 squared sample size. Um, generally, with means, we usually end up with smaller sample sizes. Proportions usually end up with really large sample sizes to, to limit that margin of error. So there we go. Um, we can not only find intervals to estimate our population parameters, but then we can actually find how big of a sample do we need if we want to to be a certain percentage confident that we are within range. Now, before we go, I want to clarify some terminology. I don't know if I mentioned this or how much I mentioned at the beginning, but for our terminology, what does it mean for a confidence interval? to be 95% confidence. What that means, if we constructed several intervals using this method, 95% of those intervals would contain the true population parameter. Now, a lot of might say, well, that just means that it's 95% chance that this interval contains the population parameter. We have to be careful of saying that. Do not say there is a 95% chance that this interval contains that parameter. Why not? Well, because before we construct the interval, if we're constructing a 95% confidence interval, before we construct it, there will be a 95, there's a 95% probability that the interval that we're going to construct will contain the, the population mean. But once we have, remember, pop, probability only governs future events. Once we have constructed future events anymore, it's done. So either it contains the true population mean or it does not. The probability does not apply to it anymore. So to say that there's a 95% chance that the population mean is in that interval is not true. It either is or it is not. Um, probability is not applicable. So what we say is we are 95% confident. That the true population mean or true population proportion, either one, is in, is in the interval or is between the values given. And so that when we're saying we're 95% confident, what we're saying is if we did this over and over again, 95% of our results would contain the means, the true population mean in the interval. I know it's a very subtle thing, but it's, it's very important. As, as you're looking at wording and selecting your your phrasing for your conclusion, um, that is important to keep in mind. Okay, well, that is all of our material for this week. Does anybody have any questions? Nope, I'm good. I'm gonna go shoot off some fireworks now. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, so it's just getting dark, so perfect timing. You guys have a great, oh, go ahead, Ashley. I was just gonna say thank you, I'm good. Sorry okay, about you're... things. You're welcome. You guys have a great night. Enjoy the fireworks. And if anything comes up, let me know. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Otherwise, have a great week. And hopefully we'll see you and more back here next Monday.
拜。